Welcome to the Newcastle University branch of the Young Archaeologists Club. Today everyone is very excited because we're going to be learning all about prehistoric stone tools. First of all we'll hear all about stone tools, where they come from, what they are and what they were used for. Then we'll take a closer look at some examples before we finally get to have a go at making our own simple stone tool. Then we'll have a think about the thought that goes into making a stone tool. This is something which you can easily do too. But first of all, what are stone tools and why are they so important? Stone tools are usually made out of a very particular stone, flint. Flint is a relatively common stone, especially in parts of southern Britain. It's often found along with chalk. Flint is special because when you hit it, it tends to break into pieces with very sharp edges. These are excellent for making stone tools. Stone tools are important because we, human beings, have relied on them for around 97% of human history. The Stone Ages, the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic and the Neolithic account for almost all of humanity's time on this planet. And as you can imagine, over such a huge amount of time, around 200,000 years, people made different types of stone tools for different reasons at different times. So, first of all, the Paleolithic or the Old Stone Age. This itself is a huge amount of time. And over the course of hundreds of thousands of years, stone tools varied immensely. From large hand axes, napped from cores of stone, to something different during the height of the last ice age, around 20,000 years ago. This was when the last ice age was at its coldest, and people were hunting a relatively limited range of animals, including mammoth and deer. And so, people developed an elegant range of tools and blades, specifically for the purpose of hunting and processing such animals. Flash forward 10,000 years, and we come to the Mesolithic, or the Middle Stone Age. This was a time after the ice had melted, and there were a lot more options for food, more animals, birds, fish, berries and trees from which to hunt and gather resources. In response, people started making microliths, tiny stone tools the size of a thumbnail. Depending upon what people came across as they went out into the landscape, these small tools could be quickly made into almost any tool or weapon that might be required. They were a very adaptable solution to a huge range of resources. The last of the Stone Ages was the Neolithic, or the New Stone Age, this was a time when one of the most important changes ever occurred. This was when people began to farm. Such a dramatic change in lifestyle also led to a change in stone tools. These tools were not only good for, say, chopping down trees, but they were also seemingly prized for their surface texture and colour. Polished axes became something desirable. An exotic new stone was something to brag about to your neighbours. So, now we know a little bit more about stone tools, it's time to dive in and take a closer look at some. Uh, well, this is a, a replica hand axe, and if it was real, it'd be about 500,000 years old. Um, this was made in France, uh, and it's a brilliant replica. But it's, it's really weird, it's like a Swiss Army knife. It's got so many bits that you could use for different jobs, like the point you could use for digging with, you could use for piercing and putting holes into things. The long flat edge you can see there is a really good cutting edge, that's a really good knife edge, but you could use it as a really nice flat scraper as well, and so if you were preparing um, hides to turn them into leather, you could take the fat from the, from the leather, uh, from the hide to, to make the leather. And then the, um, the rounded end here, that's really interesting because you can feel it, that's heavy isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's much heavier. Heavy, yeah, yeah. yeah, And that's kind of like a hammer. You could turn it round and you could use it as a hammer. Even shaving is something which Dr. Young has done with these tools. This one is much more recent. It's nearly thick this. And it's a polished axe. And it's made of stone that probably came from the Langdale area in Cumbria. 
and it starts life as a very, very rough piece of stone that gets polished, and it's polished with water on sandstone. So this is Neolithic, so this is about 6,000 years ago it was made, um, and this is an original, this is real. Uh, and this is the kind of axe that the earliest farmers in Britain would have used to cut down the trees that made the open landscape that we've got in the uplands of, say, the north of England, the fell land, you know, the moorland, um, at one time all covered by trees. This kind of tool is what starts off that process of uh, forest clearance that ultimately gives us the landscape that we've got today. Now then, these are totally different again. These are projectile points, these are proper arrowheads. And these are Bronze Age examples. Hang on, hang on a minute. Bronze Age stone tools, you may be thinking. Well, it's true. Stone tools were still being used in the Age of Bronze. And this is a broken example of what's called a barbed, this is the barbs and tanged arrowhead. And it would have sat in a shaft like that with the barbs like fishhook barbs. So once it was fired into something, the barbs mean that you can't pull it out which is kind of interesting, but look how thin it is. Oh wow, yeah. It's beautifully thin, and it's manufactured on a flake of flint that's been taken from a big block, a core, and then it's been thinned using a technique called pressure flaking. Now that's a really advanced technique of flint work. Now is the time we've all been waiting for, a chance to have a go at making a flint blade. Warning, flint can be razor sharp. Do not try this without adult supervision and the correct safety gear. What we're trying to show you how to do is to take a flake from a core, a flake from a block of flint, okay? Now, you've all got goggles on, and you've all got aprons, and you've all got gloves. That's exactly how you should do it if you're learning, right? I'm going to do it without any of that gear. I'll just use the apron because this is sharp. But really, from a health and safety point of view, you've got to have the goggles and you've got to have the gloves, okay? So I'm big enough and daft enough, I can just get on with it, and I know what I'm doing. So, I've got a hammer, I've got the flint. I put the flint on my knee, I find a nice flat surface and I set that at about 45 degrees on my knee. And then the hammer comes in at about 45 degrees and I'm trying to make a right angle. I'm trying to make a right angle there. So that the blow I hit, there, will take a flake off the core. We'll take a flake off the core. And that's all you're trying to do. And what I want to see at the end of the session is a whole load of flint laid at the bottom of your feet. Okay, just like a prehistoric flint napper, like he or she would have done. And what we'll do, we'll give everybody uh, five minutes, ten minutes each, and then we'll swap round. Okay, so it's make a platform, hit it with a hammer, and see if you can take a flake off it. We've taken a flake off the, uh, off the core there, and we can turn that, tool, that flake now into a tool. Making a stone flake is often the first step in creating a stone tool. Other more advanced techniques can be used to create beautiful, symmetrical tools which we find in the archaeological record. But more often than not, what archaeologists find is the leftovers of stone tool making, the fragments and flakes left on the floor. This is called debitage. And like a complicated jigsaw, helps us to understand how stone tools were made. Not only do stone tools and debitage give us a clue as to how our ancestors made them, they also help us to understand their brains, how they thought, and what they were capable of doing. Crucial skills for stone tool making are visualisation, imagination, and possibly language. The Renaissance artist Michelangelo once said, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. In other words, as a sculptor works, he or she must keep the finished product fixed in their mind's eye, so the sculpture can emerge from the stone. This is undoubtedly a skill, and yet another one which stone toolmakers required. You can compare yourself to your ancestors with the help of some florist's foam, preferably grey. Take a block and cut it into three chunks. Then choose your piece and think about the tool that you want to make from it. Just like flint napping, cut off a small piece at a time, a bit like the flakes we made earlier, though this time it's the core of the foam which will be the tool, not the flakes. After a while you should have a stone tool, and also plenty of debitage, but this is an excellent way to understand that it's actually quite hard to keep the design you desire in mind. And remember, you're working with soft foam, not flint, 
This is how we know that not only were our ancestors skilled tool makers, but they were also very, very clever. When you're done with your foam tool, why not stick it on top of some bamboo to make a funky spear? If you would like to know more about the Young Archaeologists Club at Newcastle University, check out this link.